November 1941, the Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. Acting Reich Protector Reinhard Heydrich establishes the Theresienstadt Ghetto, which is located in the fortress town of Theresien, about 60 kilometers north of Prague. Though Jews whom the Germans deport to the ghetto think that it is a place from which they will return home after the war is over, Theresienstadt serves mainly as a transit camp for them, en route to extermination camps. Of the approximately 140,000 Jews who will be transferred to Theresienstadt between November 1941 and May 1945, nearly 90,000 are deported to points farther east and to almost certain death. Roughly 33,000 die in Theresienstadt itself, mostly from malnutrition and disease. Approximately 90% out of 15,000 children who pass through Theresienstadt perish in killing centers, primarily Auschwitz. One of Theresienstadt's prisoners becomes a German boy who together with his parents arrives in the camp on the 19th of May 1943, two days before his 12th birthday. His name is Horst Korn. Though the Korn family and other Jews thought that it was a place from which they would return after the war, Theresienstadt served mainly as a transit camp for Jews en route to extermination camps. It was also presented by the Nazis as a model Jewish settlement for propaganda purposes. Deportees to the ghetto had to surrender all possessions except for 50 kilograms or 110 pounds of luggage, which they had to carry with them from the railway and station at Bohuschowice. 2.4 kilometers or 1.5 miles away. The walk was difficult, especially for the elderly and ill Jews. After reaching the ghetto, the prisoners were registered. The first sentence they heard was, anyone who has valuables and does not hand them over will be punished. To humiliate the new arrivals, men, women, children, and elderly people were asked to strip down naked. They were then separated and distributed to the men's and women's barracks. Conditions in the camp were harsh. Overcrowding, bed bugs, fleas, lice, lack of water and electricity, and above all, no privacy. Food was distributed to all the inmates from the central kitchens. It consisted of a portion of soup usually made of lentil powder and a potato or dumpling with gravy, never fruit or vegetables. A quarter of a loaf of bread for three days, which was one slice of bread per day. The inmates usually ate all of it the first day because they could not hide it from other starving prisoners who would eat it. The prisoners were hungry, many were sick, 200 inmates were dying daily, diseases were rampant. Conditions in the ghetto vary depending on a prisoner's status. Most prisoners were squeezed into rooms with 60 to 80 people per room. They slept on three level wooden bunks and when someone died during the night, the other prisoners threw the dead body down from the bunk. In the morning, all dead corpses were collected. Before arriving in Theresienstadt, Horst had never seen a dead person. However, already on his second day in the camp, he had to load the corpses on the handcart with his bare hands. The same handcart they used to collect bread and distribute it among the camp's prisoners. For older children, there were several separate boys and girls' heims, meaning homes. In their rooms, there was usually a table and a bench in addition to the bunks. Horst stayed with boys his age. In the barracks, there were only latrines for 100 people, no restrooms. However, the latrines were not always open, and when they were closed, the inmates who often had diarrhea soiled their trousers. Theresienstadt did not contain gas chambers, but it did contain a crematorium, which was built by ghetto prisoners by order of the SS Commandery in October 1942. The crematorium was built because after the first 10,000 people died, there was no place to bury the others. More than 30,000 corpses of the victims from the ghetto, the prison in the small fortress, and the concentration camp in Litomiazice were cremated in the camp's crematorium, which was capable of handling almost 200 bodies a day. Among Theresienstadt's prisoners were also Horst's grandparents, Gustav and Ettel. When Horst found them, they were laying on the floor unable to move as the lack of food had caused them to become ill. They died from hunger the same day. In November 1944, however, Horst found their remains when he as well as other children and women were ordered to dump urns containing ashes of former prisoners in Eger, a neighboring river. Horst knew which urns belonged to his grandparents as all the urns contained names, 
and he poured their remains into the river with his own hands. In the camp, Horst found a way to overcome hunger. He found a boy from the Viennese choir with a golden voice, and the two went to the officers' courtyards where Horst played the harmonica and the Viennese boy sang. People would come down and give not money, but each would toss a tiny breadcrumb in the hat. The amount of food they collected in the hat was equivalent to ten times the rations they usually received. Among the high-ranking Nazi representatives who visited the Theresienstadt ghetto was Adolf Eichmann, one of the major organizers of the Holocaust. On one such visit, when he was inspecting the ghetto, Horst's mother Gertrude stood in Eichmann's way. Eichmann screamed at her, Jew, get out of my way, and kicked her in the buttocks with all his strength. On the 23rd of September, 1943, Brundibar, a children's opera by Jewish Czech composer Hans Krasa, premiered in Theresienstadt. Realizing the propagandistic potential of this enormously popular artistic endeavor, the Nazis arranged a special staging of Brundibar for the propaganda film named A Documentary Film for the Jewish Settlement Area, and the same production was performed for the inspection of Theresienstadt by the International Red Cross in September 1944. This would be the last of 55 performances in the Theresienstadt ghetto, and two weeks later, transportation of artists, including children began to Auschwitz and other destinations east, silencing this, the most popular theatrical production in Theresienstadt. Among those who were murdered at Auschwitz were the children, the composer Hans Krasar, the director Kurt Geron, and the musicians. Horst played his harmonica several times during the performances of Brundibar, but neither he nor his parents were deported to the east. The reason was that in Theresienstadt, Horst's father became the camp commandant's tailor, and his mother worked in the ammunitions factory, which was essential for Germany's war effort. In early 1945, Heinrich Himmler agreed to release 1,200 Theresienstadt prisoners for 5 million Swiss francs, provided by Jewish organizations as part of a plan to use them as leverage in bargaining with the West. As a result, on the 3rd of February 1945, the Theresienstadt Commandant's Office issued an order to form a transport. Deportees from the Protectorate, Germany, Austria and the Netherlands could be included but prisoners from Denmark and Slovakia were excluded, as well as mixed-race Jews who had been deported to the camp not long before. Nearly 4,000 prisoners were selected according to these guidelines. Unlike other transports, these prisoners volunteered for the transport. However, to many it seemed too risky. They had good memory of all the Nazi deceptions and lies, and doubted that the transport would actually go to Switzerland. In the end, about 1,900 prisoners signed up, of which the camp commander, Karl Ramm, and other senior SS officers selected 1,200. Among them were Horst Korn and his parents. During the selection process, they scrutinized the prisoners and excluded those who looked bad, but also those with an academic background or those who held a prominent position in civilian life. Prisoners were not allowed to take the usual blankets and backpacks to the transport, but were given civilian luggage. On the 5th of February 1945, the Nazis released a transport, the direction Switzerland. While they were traveling through Germany, the prisoners saw the country in ruins, and soldiers with amputated legs and arms in the Waffen-SS trains. As they were crossing the border, something hit Horst's head. Horst thought that in the end the Nazis were going to kill them all, but he soon realized that it was Swiss chocolate. It was the 7th of February 1945, and the transport finally arrived in Switzerland. A train to freedom that rescued 1,200 Theresienstadt Jews from the Holocaust took them to St. Gallen. When they received food, Horst's father told him to eat only a bit. After years of starvation, the prisoner's stomach shrank to nothing, and they could only eat a tiny bit at a time. Those who ate more died of a burst stomach. 500,000 Jews were to be deported this way. However, when Adolf Hitler got to know about it, he became furious, and immediately cancelled this activity. In Switzerland, people asked Horst, how was it? In February 1945, three months before the end of the war, no one believed Horst when he told the truth about what was going on in the Nazi concentration camps. Horst and his family were allowed to stay in Switzerland for only six months, and in August 1945, 
Almost half a year after their arrival, the Korn family boarded a British warship and sailed to British-controlled mandatory Palestine. On the 9th of September 1945, they arrived in Haifa. On the following day, the family arrived in Kibbutz Ma'abarot, and soon his parents were blessed with a new son named Abi. Horst later changed his name to Svi Korn, got married, and until today lives in Kibbutz Ma'abarot in Israel. Tzvi's revenge is not only that he survived and still lectures about the hardship he endured during the Holocaust, but that his legacy and bravery will go on through his four children, six grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. A decade since the Nazis killed six million Jews in the Holocaust, only a few of those who survived are still alive to bear witness. During the production of this video, Svi told us that Hamas' surprise attack on Israel on the 7th of October 2023 during which the attackers killed 1,139 people, including 38 children, was the second hardest hit in his life, right after the Holocaust. Today, in the face of Holocaust denialism and rising nationalist sentiment across the world, it is more important than ever to share and preserve the lessons from this dark chapter of history, because those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Thanks for watching the World History Channel. Be sure to like and subscribe, and click the bell notification icon so you don't miss our next episodes. We thank you, and we'll see you next time on the channel.